Welcome to Her Story, the history of Southeast Asia told from her perspective. We'll discover historical figures, matriarchal societies, and contemporary female icons, and maybe learn about ourselves along the way. I'm Agas Ramirez. Apparently, the train broke down over the Guadalupe Bridge. Service crew found it like this. Lots of blood, no bodies. <laughs> a pile of missing persons reports. Tabi tabi po. Greetings, young Tracy. Good evening, Nuno. There was a time when magic in the world was a natural part of life. That age has passed. People fear what they don't understand. That's why our family has always been the bridge between mankind and the supernatural. What the hell are we dealing with? A lot of tribes are on edge, making bad deals with better folk. That balance you and your father have tried so desperately to maintain is at its end. You're treading on very thin ice, little Tressy. Can't be too sure about the underworld these days. Please help me. You are the Babaylan Mandarigma, healer and warrior. Ibunyan ang nakatago. You were born ready. Hank, the creature is a Chana. Do you hear it calling for me? Ah, you want my advice? Keep your heads down. They're coming for revenge. If the Lacan gets in the way, kill her. There's something bigger going on here. The tribes need to be united. Well, the Tempest is brewing, and there are liars amongst your allies. Come on, boys. Let's put an end to this. Welcome to the podcast, Kai. Hello, thank you for having me. So you are a student, you are a former molecular biology major, and you're currently a musicology major, is that right? Yes. Okay, so tell us a bit about yourself, how you became interested in history and comic books. Uh, well, you see, my father and older brother are also like really big history nerds. So growing up, like a lot of our round table family dinner discussions would revolve around like discussing past and present events, what lessons we can learn, and just a, really a lot of nerdy discussions. And sometimes we even debate with one another, but it's all it's all for learning. Um, I also grew up traveling a lot. So aside from my usual going back and forth between Japan and the Philippines, we'd also go to other countries, visiting the historical sites, and just generally studying about about the country. And as for comics, my older brother got me into most of them. He's like 10 years older than me, so I think our sibling dynamic might be different compared to most, but we're pretty close for the most part, and he taught me so many things. All right, so uh, this is the third installment of the episode on the Babaylan of pre-colonial Philippines, and what serendipity that Trese came out last month, giving us even more to talk about. Uh, for those who are not familiar, Trece is a Filipino comic series written by Bujet Tan and illustrated by Kajo Baldissimo. It tells the story of Alexandra Trece, a detective who deals with crimes of supernatural origin. So its first issue was published in 2005, and the animated adaptation for Netflix premiered on June 11. So, Kai, you are a big fan of Trece. Yes. Hey, tell, fan. tell us about that. How did you discover Trece? What do you love about it? Um, let's see. Like like with most things, I discovered Tressa because of my older brother. He had like a collection of like the first I think there were only three volumes out at that time. But yeah, after a while, um so my brother again, he's like ten years older than me, so he'd be gone from the house most of the time. So he wouldn't have his collection. So I started like buying my own copies and um eventually I, I'm really updated right now. <laughs> so I have like the the main series, all seven volumes. And then I also have like the side stories, the additional art, all that. Um, what I love about it is that I grew up, yeah, very, very historical nerds family, mm -hmm. nerd type family. So um, one of my favorite series growing up as well was like Percy Jackson. 
So I really like the idea of being able to incorporate like the, this fantasy mytho- mythology that's thought to be ancient and putting them in, in like present day settings. And the fact that it was done in a way with Trece and like Philippine mythology as a Filipino, it's something that's really interesting and really nice to see for me. Do you remember when you started reading? Oh my goodness. I probably around high school. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, so that was, I'm about to show my age, but around a decade ago. Mm, I will also show my age. I was about um, in maybe third year of college. Oh. And I remember very distinctly that there was supposed to be this um, meetup. They were going to come to UP oh, for yeah. Sakal. And um, so I brought all my Trece books and <laughs> I wanted oh. to get them signed. But um, they were not able to make it. Manik Sobrera was oh, there, no. but Bojetan and Kajo Balisimo could not make it. Um, I was heartbroken and I still like telling that story to this day. But anyway. That's a great story. <laughs> okay, so um, shortly after the release of the series, your Twitter thread on Trece went viral. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that that's how. Me, honestly. That's how. That's how I found you, actually. So, <laughs> thank you. You talked about the Lacan and the Babaylan, and why Trese being a woman is important. So, in the series, Trese is a Babaylan Madirigma, an appointed spiritual leader and guardian of a city. She was called the Lacan ng Sangkatauhan. So, what what is the Lacan in simplest terms? Um, one of the translations of Lacan is like the divine ruler, or in some cultures they would call it God King. Mm. So it's like they're the very they're at the very very top in terms of in terms of leadership, and they don't just lead the people like physically, like uh, in terms of government and all that. They also lead the people spiritually and in a religious manner. So yeah, I thought that was like really important because like the common misconception is that these positions in ancient Filipinos or on- in ancient Philippines are only held by men. Mm-hmm. That's simply not true. Like there are records of Datu and Raja that are also that are also women. Same with Lakan. There have been records of of both men and women holding those positions. But it's especially important that um, in Trese that she is a woman holding that position considering our colonial past and what was done to our religious leaders who were female. So yeah, it was, that's why I think it's really important. Um, we've spent some time fleshing out the Babaylan in the two previous installments. So um, let's talk about the Babaylan as portrayed in Trese by Alexander Trese. Um, we saw that she was uh, in fact carrying out the very important uh, Babaylan role of mediating between the worlds, um, so uh, what do you what did you think about that when you saw well in the in the trailer they they already mentioned that she was the Babaylan Mandirigma um, as a comic book fan as a history fan how did that make you feel? It was great because again there's a lot of misconceptions when it comes to Philippine history again due to our colonial past and like just. The fact that it's so difficult to study it due to um, due to a lot of records being burned. I think I, I got into an argument with somebody a few months ago who said that... Show, so he asked me where the burned records were. And I was like, can you read your sentence again? <laughs> They're burned. <laughs> They're um... burned. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, it has been documented um, by... I can't remember his name right now, but then he went with Magellan during his expedition and he documented the fact that they burned bamboo records. Um, So, yeah, to see... And then the thing about the Babaylan role, like, I remember when I wrote the thread, I felt like crying while I was writing it because I was Mm -hmm. remembering what was done to our ancestors, to the fact that our... that women were such powerful leaders in our communities back then they held so much authority people respected them and compared to the way women are being treated now Mm -hmm. about how we constantly hear jokes about how you know you can just uh how do you say this in english how we can just be rude to them without any consequence because that's just their role in society it's 
it's very it's very painful to see this kind of contrast. Now to see the first Filipino animated series have like a lead who's a woman mm-hmm. in such a powerful position, not needing anybody to save her. It's it's such it's such a nice thing. It's such a nice thing to see. Like feminism has has made so many strides over the past years, but I've always felt like certain countries lagged a bit behind in that regard. So seeing this, it was there are just no words to describe the amount of happiness I felt. When you were watching Trese, were there um, maybe historical references or uh, folklore references that you wish they expounded a bit more on? Mm, less folklore references, um, but more of some things that I felt were fleshed out more in the comics than they were in the series. Mm-hmm. Like, I thought it was a little... Uh, the second episode, I think it was, the one with um, Kulimlim, with the, with the ele- electricity gods. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It was, yeah. For me, I felt a little vague. The re- They didn't really explain like why he was like accepting um, sacrifices from people and what people exactly were getting out of it. It wasn't fleshed out much. I, th- I thought it was a little... It could have been confusing to those who didn't who didn't know the comics, who didn't read the comics. Um, same thing with when they were getting into Ramona, the rebel, the yeah, the rebel yes, who yes. yeah, who's the mother of twins. I thought it was also a little vague about the how the ritual went, how they summoned the uh, the god, the war god. So, Talagbusao. Talagbusao, yeah. Right. How they summoned Talagbusao. It was I thought it was vague, they didn't really explain it that well in the series which i i understand because i mean they have to condense it they have to condense as much plot as possible but i'm just think in my head i'm just thinking oh it's gonna encourage people to read the comics more you know hmm. um how, where are they in the comics now would you know how how many books there are now seven volumes i believe there are seven volumes. yes um, so what was your favorite thing in Jesse season one? Mine was probably the every scene with San Telmo or St. Oh, Elmo's yeah. fire, for those who don't know. It's funny because um, San Telmo is summoned by a Nokia, and we all know how powerful the Nokia is. Yeah. So <laughs> I thought like all of their interactions were so funny because the San Telmo was, was the San Telmo was so playful. Episode, um, yeah. <laughs> what was uh, what were your favorite things in season one? Um, okay, it's a very minor detail, but I one of my favorite things was that the Sigbin or the people who were like the bodyguards of Tressa's dad. Um, I like that they were called Bantai and Pute because <laughs> in Filipino culture, they yeah. Uh, yeah, those are like the st- two of the most stereotypical Filipino dog names, <laughs> yeah. and they turn into big dogs i don't know i just i just thought that was so funny and like a really good detail <laughs> and fun fact though they changed how sigbin look like because they made them more werewolf like also in the comics but mm. they were originally more like the chupacabra so more goat like mm. but then yeah it's a it's a nice change there are there are some regions that have sigbin to be more dog like so it, it's fine it was fine i liked it uh, what was the name of the um, the son of the Capre? Uh, I forgot uh, his name. Oh, Tigbalang, the, the sorry. Tigbalang, yeah. Tigbalang, uh, Maliksi, yeah. Maliksi. Maliksi, yeah. right. I remember in the comics, there was a bit of shipping going on between Yeah. I personally, and didn't Maliksi. Subs- I personally didn't subscribe to it, but I see the appeal. <laughs> and um, he's definitely going to appear later on. No spoilers, mm. but he's he's, <laughs> he's coming back. He's coming back. For for the Maliksi fans there, he's coming back. Don't worry. In your uh in your reading, and I know you're very interested in uh Babaylan uh, history also, uh did you feel like there could have been more um exposition on rituals? Uh because I I I something I felt like was a bit missing in the in in the show was I wanted to see a bit more of her uh, spiritual leadership side. There was a lot Ooh, of action, yeah. but but that was good because it's an anime. But yeah. um, there was an opportunity there. But um, in the comic books, is there more of that? I don't really remember. 
not that much as far as I can remember. Like, it's a lot of in the investigative side. That's where the rituals come in. Mm. Though I do... I do like that they're able. They were able to in, incorporate some like sigils during the combat, but I honestly think that they there could be a bit more. Um, though I think I've seen their rituals a bit more in the side stories over mm. the over the main stories. Um, in my yeah, I think if I remember correctly, mm. but yeah, they they can do a bit more with the rituals because right now it feels like they're just there to add a bit color and there isn't much focus done on them. Hmm. Hopefully in season two. Yes, we should get a season two. <laughs> um, so Trese, as we've mentioned here, has been such a landmark production for Filipino writers and artists. And um, because we are seeing these stories as a mainstream anime for the first time. When I first read Trese back in college, I, it was unthinkable. I would never, never would have thought that this would be on Netflix. So, yeah. And you're a young artist. What does this Netflix series mean to you specifically? It shows that one, that there's not just like um, a market for it, but there's a platform for it as well. Mm-hmm. Because we we know that Filipinos, that we will eat up anything that has somebody who's even one eighth Filipino in it. <laughs> right? So we know there's a market. Yeah. But the question has always been who is going to give us an opportunity who was going to give us a chance. So this just shows that, um, you know, there are people out there who can and will give us a chance mm-hmm. should we, you know, we just have to fight for it. We just have to keep going for it. So like you would think, especially in the arts, one of the things that parents would tell you is like, don't pursue it. There's mm-hmm. no money there. But and it, I know it's something that has deterred people for so long. And even even me, it's deterred me for so long. There's a reason why I only shifted out of my science course on the last year. Mm-hmm. <laughs> even though even though I've been leaning, I've always leaned more towards the arts than I did towards science. There's a reason why I didn't shift out until very, very late. But this really just shows that, you know, we can we can do this level of production. We can make things of really good quality and there are people who can and will give us a chance so yeah i guess it's more of a lesson for us to like don't stop like don't stop persevering don't stop trying because eventually you know we'll find an opportunity i'm curious you're you're a musicology major yes um how did you find the music in the series oh my gosh Oh my gosh. Okay. So, <laughs> oh, I'm going to go on a rabbit hole. But, um, okay, first let's talk about the opening. Yes. I really, really loved the opening. Like, I saw a post on Facebook that wanted, that thought it was a missed opportunity for them to use some Filipino. I rock saw song. that. Right, right, right. I, I honestly that. got personally offended <laughs> by that post. <laughs> like, the, not, to dis- not to discredit their work, it was a very good edit. Mm. But you are missing the point of the of the actual intro that's there. The intro, um, um, it was the opening was made by Kiner Brothers Music, mm. and it samples uh, Baluhad Bayaw, uh, Bayawen, mm. which is a an ifugao hudhud. Mm, yes. And then the reason why for me it was extremely important that they chose. An Ifugao Hood Hood to be like one of to be a component in the opening. The reason for that is because Hood Hood are narrative poems that are done in the form of chan, chants. So, like I mentioned, they are traditionally done by the Ifugao community. Now, the thing about the Ifugao culture is that it's based on kinship with the mother, or you, as you can say, it's like it's a very matrilineal culture. Mm-hmm. So, in the community. The woman takes the main part of the chants with her brother occupying a higher position than her husband. Mm. So the chants, they're often about heroes, laws, religious beliefs, and practices. And as mentioned before, the narrators were mainly women and they held important positions in their community as historians and preachers. So for me, that that choice, that very specific choice of using an Ifugao hood hood, it's extremely important. It already tells you a lot about 
the series. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, and throughout the series, you can hear in the soundtrack, you can hear references to um, traditional Filipino instruments, to traditional Filipino, used in traditional Filipino tunings, tunings, because sometimes they won't use the actual instrument, they'll use more modern instruments. But the way that the notes, the notes that they used are based on the tuning of the traditional instruments. So even there, you can hear the references to Filipino culture, and you can tell that's that was exactly what they were trying to do. So yeah. Um. Any other uh, parts of the series that used um, specific songs or instruments that you would want us to take note of? Not none that I can th- think of right now, but I do want to point out that they brought back. They also they didn't just use the the Balau, Baluhad Bayauhen in mm-hmm. the opening. They also used it later on, right before Trese is about to go to do her trials in mm-hmm. the Ballet de Tree. And it's important that they used it there because the song is generally about someone, a woman specifically, going to a tree, if I remember correctly. Oh. Yeah. And mm-hmm. um, I'm not so sure, but um, this is just based on like my memory, but if I remember correctly, in that story, so the woman has to go into a tree and her father wants to go with her but can't. Mm-hmm. So it echoed a lot of how um, Anton Trese has to give this responsibility to his daughter, but he wants to help her as much as he can. He wants to be with her in that trial, but he couldn't. So the most that he could do is give her, literally give her her sister in the form of a weapon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And interestingly, the Balete tree has always been the sacred tree of the Babaylan. Yes, it has. So that all really nicely ties in with... Um, and uh, it was also... I, there were a lot of uh, epicos in... Epics yeah. in Filipino history that uh, have to do with these trials. Mm-hmm. So I thought that was a good uh, callback. To, it was. It was a really uh, good callback. Yeah, you know, like epics that um, we learn about in school. Yeah. Um. What What do you hope to see next? Do you want a season two? Are there plot lines? Oh, I that definitely want yeah. a season two. <laughs> <laughs> I I can't I can't get enough of I can't get enough of Tressa. Like until now, like I've been I've I've actually watched Tressa four times. Did you watch um, it in every dub? Not every dub. I watched it in English, obviously, in Filipino. Uh, mm. But I also watched it in Japanese because I'm mm. fluent in Japanese. And then I watched it in Spanish with my dad because my dad's more fluent in Spanish than I am. I can only, like, understand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to hear the differences and how they were de- delivered and which dub I liked the most. Mm. Oh, wh- which dub did you like the most? Oh my goodness, this is a very, <laughs> very <laughs> it's a point of contention. I've but... only I've only seen the Filipino dub. I didn't even watch the others. So. Yeah, I okay. <laughs> before I say my answer, I will say that I really liked the I liked the Filipino dub. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, I did have some issues here and there, mm-hmm. but for the most part, it was it was good. Mm-hmm. It was good. But I pers- I just personally preferred the English dub mm-hmm. because um aside okay, people who are gonna hear this and like find me on social media might find <laughs> out, and they probably will find out that I'm a fan of Shay Mitchell. But oh. that is not the reason why I prefer the English dub. Mm-hmm. Um Shay Mitchell's um pronunciations, they had they left a lot to be desired, but you can hear that she actually put a lot into a lot of effort mm-hmm. into studying the proper way it's supposed to be pronounced and I really appreciate her for that and just generally the voice the English voice cast was just so good mm-hmm. I have to I just have to they slightly edge out the Filipino dub just slightly mm-hmm. it's a very close it's very narrow <laughs> yeah so uh, are there other myth-related works that you would love to see adapted? Because I know people really like Arnold Aris' mythology class, which was published maybe like a decade before Trese. Um, I yeah. have a copy. Haven't read mm-hmm. it yet, but I have a copy. Um, you're into comics. Uh, yeah. What would you want to see? Oh, okay. If we're talking just related to Filipino myths mm-hmm. in, that, in that realm, 
Um, I would personally love to see Fr- uh, Francis V. Kuching's uh, Pedro Penduco. Oh, right. Yeah, and I feel like it would appeal a lot, especially to like the younger audience, or, like a young adult type, you know, fighting, doing like getting into all sorts of shenanigans with really with regarding to like you know the mythical the mythical creatures and Filipino myths. And I have that. a question. Yeah. Are you old enough to remember Jano Gibbs as Pedro Penduco? Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, but that was. That was. I love that as a child. So. Yeah, as a child. It's, and then you don't want to watch it again when you get older because you don't want, like. To ruin. Yeah. Yes, to ruin the beautiful memory of yeah. Pedro Penduco. I agree. If we're going into um, Filipino superheroes, I would love to see the whole Mars Ravalo series oh, just yeah. make a comeback. Uh huh. Yeah, because like we're in the age where like the MCU is is killing it, mm-hmm. and the DCU has been has been getting better, has been catching up. Um, there are all these superhero related films and shows coming out back to back. I think it would be like a really good time to bring back Mars Ravelo's superheroes. Who's your favorite Mars Ravelo superhero? Darna. <laughs> Darna. Oh, they they're Darna. making a new Darna, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, it's, I'm not sure how the progress is, but I have hopes for it. Mm, I think uh, it's Jane De Leon who's uh, playing the oh, new, really? J- uh, yeah, Jane De Leon's playing the new Darna. Um, who is my favorite? I remember, I remember liking Captain Barbell when I was Oh, there. yeah. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> yeah, very, very fun. He's a very fun character. Anything else you want to share, or maybe you want to um invite our? <laughs> you want? Do you maybe you'd want to invite the five listeners of this podcast? To... <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I'm a part time Twitch streamer, I guess. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I just stream on twitch.tv slash um, Kaiju Kugel. Mostly play Valorant, so I don't know if people are into that. But uh, yeah, I play Valorant, and sometimes uh, people from my Twitter hop on there to ask me questions. Because like, uh, my Twitter account actually started off as like a comic account mm. centered around one character called Emiko Queen. Mm-hmm. Um, she's she's from DC Comics and the younger half sister of Oliver Queen, who's Green Arrow. Mm. Uh, yeah, and and since then I've kind of like been known as the thread person. <laughs> so, if you, so like if you go through my my account, like I have so many threads, not just about like Filipino culture, but Japanese culture as well. Well, mm. because I'm part Filipino, part Japanese. Mm-hmm. So yeah i i share i tend to share a lot about both cultures because i know that there are a lot of misconceptions about japanese culture because of popular media and philippine culture isn't very well known mm-hmm. so i thought of i thought of using my platform as like an opportunity to you know educate and inform people and i did grow up with an older brother and a father who basically every day you learn something new mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, there you go. I'm going to link uh, Kai's Twitter account in the description if you want to follow her or ask her any more questions about her favorite dubs. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, so that, th- that's it. Thank you, Kai. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We hope that this episode inspires you to take a bigger interest in our history and to create art, vlogs, podcasts, music, stories that will introduce our pre-colonial history to a bigger audience and a new generation. And that's it for episode 15.3. I will see, hear you in a couple of months for season two, where we will be focusing on Southeast Asia's colonial period. So thank you again, Kai. Thank you so much for having me. Producing a podcast like this takes a lot of time and research. If you like what we do, consider joining our Patreon. And if you can't join us on Patreon, just tell your friends about this podcast. That works too. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Her Story C Pod. That's Her Story S E A Pod. There are so many more stories to tell, and we're just getting started. This podcast was written, hosted, and edited 
by Agas Ramirez. Thank you for listening and I hope to see you again next time. Sampai jumpa lagi.